A warm welcome to you, John T. What do you have for us after hearing Anna? It's getting to be quite scary. Uh, cyber extortion is rife. Uh, do we have a way to uh, catch the attackers before they strike? Yeah, exactly. Um, to be honest, I'm, I'm absolutely blown away by all the presentations so far. And it actually works quite nicely into what I'm going to be speaking about today as well. So on the one hand, we're talking about all of the threats, all of the things that are popping up in the world today and the way in which the, the criminals are getting a bit cleverer about how to attack and again, specifically in the finance sector. Uh, for me today is partially about that and it's also about how do we stay ahead of the attacker and how do we use artificial intelligence on our side to really gain a bit of traction in defending our environments and making sure we put a, a good foot forward. So I'm going to share my screen if, if that's okay and jump straight in. Um, if I can just do this, give me a second. And I think just to just to quickly introduce myself, uh, obviously Anisha just did quite a stellar introduction there. I really enjoyed that. But I actually come from a banking background. I've got a PhD in finance and, and banking itself. I spent eight years working for Barclays, ABSA across Africa, and I was specifically focused on financial derivatives data, looking at systems integrations and things like that. I had a bit of a midlife crisis for myself in cybersecurity, and it's been an incredible journey so far. So today at the moment, I am obviously, as I mentioned, a commercial director and regional director for Dark Trace Africa. I am focusing specifically on building the business across the African continent and really securing and working very closely with a lot of our large strategic accounts across the region. Now, when we start talking about strategic accounts and large accounts, often this does fall into the finance space. And the reason for that is being, well, for that being is the fact that finance and uh, fintech and banking and all of that is really, really a big key focus for attackers at the moment. It's something that is very well known, but at the end of the day, a banking institution is just going to be that much more targeted than any other organization. And a lot of the time it's due to sensitive data, sensitive information, the financial risk is associated to it. and what that really means is that attackers are kind of targeting these these organizations a little bit more closely as much of you in the crowd today will will be seeing as well so maybe just as a quick introduction to what we're going to be chatting about today so on the first topic we're going to be chatting around the challenges facing banks and finance uh, individuals in terms of security. This is obviously looking at uh, a small range of things, but Anna in the previous conversation actually brought up quite a lot of these things that we'll, we'll be reiterating and, and going into a bit of depth into. Uh, secondly, we're going to chat around the digital acceleration and global disruption. At the end of the day, there's, there's been quite a change in, in the last couple of years and in terms of how people work, how people run their daily businesses, and what that really does have an impact on in terms of security and how your organizations operate from a security perspective. Thirdly, we're going to be chatting around the application of artificial intelligence. And again, this is where I start to dive into some of the, the, the really good work that Darktrace has been doing, but not only Darktrace, it's more about the application of artificial intelligence in cybersecurity to really be putting us on the front foot rather than taking a reactive approach. Finally, I'm going to touch on a couple of case studies, a couple of interesting things we've chatted about and, and picked up when, when deploying dark trace across our customer base. Uh, you'll see that there's a spoofing attempt and some SaaS application um, leverage that we're going to be really talking about in, in the coming slides. So with that, and without further ado, I'm, I'm going to jump in. I'll, I'll obviously save any questions for the end. If there's anything, um, please just shout to, to the event organizers. But I'm really here to, to provide a bit of insight into, into the world of dark trace and advanced AI in cybersecurity. Now, jumping into, I suppose, the, the world of, of threats and uh, the specific focus for the financial sector. What we really are seeing an increase in at the moment, and this is across our global deployments, 
is a huge number of increases in the banking closures and supply chain attacks. Now, obviously being in the financial sector, majority of you probably understand exactly what this means, but looking at banking trojans, this is someone leveraging uh, a particular attack vector to try and get sensitive information from a client or uh, someone within the organization itself to, to potentially leverage a potential, whether it's, it's malicious or not, inside a threat of sorts. Uh, exactly the same thing with the supply chain attack. Maybe someone's trying to step in between you and another vendor or uh, you and the client, making sure that they can be that middleman in terms of receiving payments or something along those lines, rather than actually getting into your organization itself. Uh, it, it means that attackers are getting really creative in the way in which they are attacking and taking actions in your environment. And what that means is from a protective side or a defensive side, we really need to get creative around how we protect as well. Secondly, looking at state-sponsored cyber attacks, I mean, this is, this is huge. And, and I actually mentioned it in the previous, previous presentation as well. With the state-sponsored cyber attacks and what's really happening in the world at the moment is a lot of financial institutions and, and fintech organizations are actually just part of collateral damage when it comes to these attacks. If there is, for example, something happening between the US and Iran, what might be a political warfare or something along those lines that, that might be military based often ends up in the cyber world and often as things, as things play out and as things happen, if someone's going to be attacking, say, the US as a state-sponsored attack, they're going to go for all of the critical infrastructure. They're going to go for the critical organizations, the, the, the key companies that are really keeping the United States afloat. And in this case, for example, when there was an attack on uh, Iranian military leader, on the, the reverse of that, Iran rebutted with a full-on attack across the, the large financial sector in the US. And what that ultimately put a lot of pressure on is private organizations or public organizations as well. But a lot of the time, financial services is the first and um, the, the, the most targeted because it really does bring down an economy in a very short space of time if one cannot actually have access to credit or uh, access to finance or access to money. Now, that is obviously something that is obviously completely top of mind a lot of the time. And it's not just happening overseas, it's actually happening in Africa too. I mean, we've got some really interesting examples of this in Ethiopia and Egypt with the Great Dam, uh, ultimately with some political tensions, there have been cyber attacks from Egypt into Ethiopia as well. That being said, uh, that's not the only threat. Um, a lot of the time, it's actually our own users. It's the insiders, it's the uh, team members that we rely so heavily on to, to do business for us. And a lot of that, especially in the last two years, has been a result of remote workers, um, unmonitored remote workers, people that are maybe not as clued up on cybersecurity as they should be. Uh, and at the end of the day, what that really means is that we've kind of opened up our landscape of attack and it's made our lives a little bit trickier in protecting our environment because, well, now we have our colleagues sitting at home, sitting on guest Wi-Fi's and you don't really have the ability to understand and monitor and control what they do in the same form or same manner. This obviously opens up extra vectors to, to attacks. And as we start to deploy technology to assist those people to do what they need to do, it really does, again, open up further avenues of, of potential uh, weakness in, in those technologies. Now, fourthly, I, I always, this, this speaks close to my heart when, when I was working in the banking sector, I, I always just assumed things worked perfectly before I got in, into the bank. I, I really just thought, well, geez, these are really slick, smooth run operations. And when you get there, you realize, oh, wait, actually, there's quite a lot of um, old infrastructure, things that might be a little bit outdated and things come into that like budgets and costs and uh, obviously long term partnerships and, and uh, decisions that obviously go up to board level. But what that really does put a priority on 
for me is an urgency to upgrade digital banking infrastructure. With that comes again, potential for threat because when you want to roll something out or when you want to deploy something quickly, it often leaves room for error or it leaves gaps in terms of security that you haven't potentially considered or, or thought about as rolling out these projects. And then finally, obviously a really huge one. This is, this is something that I'm sure all of you are very, very familiar with, but regulations. At the end of the day, this is something that pretty much every single person working in the financial sector has to abide by, whether it is compliance with things like GDPR, uh, whether it's compliance with PCI DSS on the payment side, there are quite a few extra additional regulatory requirements that come when one considers client sensitive information and client data and obviously securing it. Uh, as a result of that, there's, there's potential for regulatory fines, there's obviously potential for um, I suppose, reputational damage. And then obviously any, any disruption to op operational business, it really does have an impact on your profitability. So that being said, obviously regulation is, is a huge one and compliance is, is, is always, always gonna be massive. And this is when, whenever we talk to clients, we actually really drive to have the compliance team and the regulatory team involved in those conversations, because at the end of the day, this is really where we can help influence a board level because this is where the cost often lies. That being said, now we can move on to just some threats by numbers. This is gonna give just a really high level insight into, into what we've been seeing in the market. You'll see a lot of these numbers reference the year 2020. It's well, as close as we are to ending 2021, we're not just there yet. So with that being said, these, these numbers all reference 2020. But for me, what's quite interesting is that 65% of financial services organizations were victim of some form of attack in 2020. Now that's huge. That's pretty much seven out of 10. That is really, really large. And again, these are also organizations that are spending more money on technology, more money on security. And for seven out of those, those 10 organizations to be, be hit in some form, well, it, it really is saying something that there is actually a huge need to bed down and increase the focus on proactive protection. Secondly, 31% increase in cost of insider threats globally. Um, this, is, this is huge. This, basically speaks to your malicious insiders, even your unwitting insiders who don't really know that they're doing something wrong or are potentially being leveraged by a third party attacker. At the end of the day, this is really a large attack vector because if someone has the ability to leverage an insider to get into an organization, it just makes their job that much easier in terms of manipulating what they need to do. Then finally, 18.4 is the million average, 18.4 million is the average cost of a cyber attack on a banking organization. Obviously, these are some global stats and, and those numbers are really large. Uh, it might not be exactly the same in Africa, but that being said, it is absolutely huge. It's a phenomenal number that uh, organizations and finance have to really deal with. And a lot of the time, especially in the innovation and, and FinTech space, this can actually cripple an organization or cripple a business as it's really starting out and starting to, to be uh, a key player in the payments and finance, finance world. Now, that being said, a, a couple other things to note, um, uh, finance and banking institutions are 300 times more likely to be attacked than any other organization. Uh, IP theft, this is as, as much as we want to be able to put a number on, on IP theft, it's, it's near impossible. Uh, an example of, of IP theft, and this might not be in the banking sector specifically, but a report was created uh, recently, I can reference it for you as well, where uh, Chinese, um, Chinese uh, individuals were able to get into um, the US basically the military records and get a hold of a huge number of uh, protected documents, things that are really privately kept information. And uh, this report is basically speaking to the ability for China to accelerate its military as well as economic development 
through the single breach or this the slow, low and slow attack on the US military. Now, what that really does is it, it puts an, an entire country and entire region far further ahead than it potentially otherwise would be. So the cost of the attack is, again, completely immeasurable. Now, think about that in the, in the finance and banking space of your uh, personal information or your private information key to your, your company strategy had to get in the hands of a potential, a potential um, competitor. Well, how would that actually impact you? And would that be something that could potentially cripple the business? Again, just food for thought. And finally, I suppose I mentioned obviously the, the average cost of a cyber breach on banking organizations, but the average cost of a data breach is 3.65, just checking, sorry, $3.86 million per data breach. Now, again, really large numbers, but these data breaches are, are immeasurable in a sense because it speaks to reputational damage, it speaks to regulatory fines, and then it also speaks to disruption of business. Now, that's obviously just a bit of a summary around threats and, and the numbers associated to it. This is, I suppose, something quite interesting from my perspective, where, where I find just looking at, uh, at a couple of details associated to, to stats and, and what's really happening in the world. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of them, but a couple that stand out for me. 80% of Fortune 500 companies are actually exposed at the moment. This means actually only one in five Fortune 500 companies are feeling comfortable and are comfortable with their security posture at the moment. Uh, secondly, when Darktrace runs trials, we, we, and we do many, many, many of these, 74% of the time, we are able to detect serious threats that others have missed within the first week or so. Now, that obviously means that a lot of the time organizations feel like they're comfortable or they feel like they're in a good organizational space in terms of security, but at the end of the day, they are not. They are not. They are the unknown unknowns, the things that you would pro probably miss or the, the, the potential threats that kind of go under the radar that you have absolutely no idea about. And this is really where, where we're trying to change that perception of security and the way in which you need to approach it to be able to pick up those anomalies and those threats, again, that you otherwise wouldn't. 83% um, of professionals believe that AI augmentation is necessary for cyber defense. And as I'm sure all of you are aware, you probably are under a lot of pressure, whether it's resource constraints or just too much work. At the end of the day, you always are going to really need some form of AI augmentation to help you do your job better and to provide an additional layer of security when you might be um, taking a rest or your eyes might be sleeping, it might be the weekend, who knows, even if you have a full SOC team running 24 hours, seven days a week, there's always the capacity for someone to potentially miss something and build in a bit of human error when, when analyzing events. Now, those are just some stats, I'm not going to go through all of them, but at the end of the day, it really does speak to the need of uh, building a, a robust, secure, and strategic environment that is able to protect your organization. Now, let's talk around the, the approach that Darktrace uses and the approach that uh, I suppose is traditionally seen in the market. What we generally see and what has been, I suppose, tradition for, for the last however many years is that technology is going to really use a static rules and signatures approach that's going to be pre-programmed. It's going to be saying, look for A, B, C, and D. And if I find A, B, C, and D, great, well, then I can stop A, B, C, and D. Now, the problem with that and the small issue associated to that is that you're always going to be one step behind the attacker. You're not going to be able to be as proactive you're not going to be able to take a holistic view of your environment because at the end of the day, you're always going to rely on something that's pre-programmed and something that's already happened to define what a potential attack looks like in your environment. Now, that also adds to potential new and novel threats. How does one define and pre-program specific policies 
or a threat that's never ever come across your organization or any other organization in the world. If it's completely manipulated and focused on your organization, well, you actually need a piece of AI to be able to proactively stop that. What we're seeing is also in terms of uh, the approach, it's often very siloed, a lot of point solutions with limited scope and visibility. At the end of the day, when you're able to integrate across your entire digital infrastructure and you're able to consolidate and build context across your digital estate, you're gonna have a much better understanding of what's actually happening and therefore be able to take a better approach to, to securing it. So again, as a, as a Summary and a recap, legacy and traditional tools and approaches are generally retrospective, static, and siloed. Now, what Darktrace is doing is a little bit different to that. What we really are relying on is self-learning artificial intelligence. We use a combination of unsupervised, supervised, and deep learning. But primarily, it's actually the unsupervised machine learning that's the kicker here. We use this artificial intelligence to really understand and learn your environment like no other. There's no need to go to an external, uh, external threat intelligence or any external data source to understand whether this anomaly has been seen before. We can understand through that self-learning AI what happens in your environment, what doesn't happen in your environment, and then we can quickly see, okay, wait, this is something that's different, and this is something that you really need to focus on because we've never seen this type of behavior before. Now, we even have, I suppose, clustering within that that's able to get to a really fine level of detail to say, okay, wait, this device or this user or even the context within this email is so different compared to usual behavior, but also different compared to other users' behaviors or broadly the organization as a whole. And then within that, we can start to build and also show real-time threats as they're happening, but also build an understanding of, um, I suppose, novel threats that have never been seen in the world before. Now, Touching on this and, and recapping, we are looking at everything from, I suppose, the self-learning side, looking at the, the need to, well, being able to get rid of constantly updating your security function. Darktrace is going to continuously learn and build that understanding as it goes along. And at the end of the day, it's also accessing and learning new things about your environment as, as you grow and as you change as an organization. If you bring on a, a new part of the business or you start to change the way in which you interact with certain individuals or uh, certain parts of the business, well, Darktrace can understand and learn that and say, okay, wait, this user, this part of the business has changed the way and we'll continuously learn and, and define that. There's no need for a, a specific individual to say, okay, I'm stepping in to now change this rule or change the signature, change this policy. That really is going to be very cumbersome and, and take up a lot of necessary time from a security professional who could really be focusing on key issues rather than doing things like updating policies. Now, Looking at the, the big kicker here, this is where it gets really awesome. So instead of just providing awesome visibility across your, your entire, entire digital estate, what Darktrace is able to do is not only investigate and provide really good insights into the potential attack chains and attack vectors, but we're also able to step in with autonomous response. Now, this is something that is key. If you're able to step in within the space of two to seven seconds to contain and quarantine any malicious activity, well, that means that there's a bigger chance that your organization is going to maintain compliance and be protected. Even if you've got a large SOC and a large organization, it's going to really, really make it uh, something of interest to, to protect it as it happens so that there's no lateral movement and make sure that obviously the SOC team is, is able to then proactively take, take action against any malicious threats. Now, this really speaks to, to working faster and, and reacting faster than human teams. It's that safety net. If maybe you have a, a team that um, doesn't necessarily work weekends, for example. Um, if, for example, there's something that happens at 2 a.m. on a Saturday morning, maybe a piece of ransomware. Well, you want to know that there's technology in place to stop that, quarantine it, make sure it doesn't move laterally, 
and at the end of the day, provide safety and security until the team comes on, on Monday morning, for example. And I think what's most important is obviously taking action in a proportionate manner, making sure that when action is taken, it's not disrupting business as usual. So what that really means is taking action in a proportionate way so that this user can continue doing their daily job, but any malicious outbound traffic or any malicious content that could be potentially coming into your organization is stopped and contained without that user even knowing. Uh, the same applies for emails. If we want to ensure, I suppose, business continuity, we still really want to try and ensure that those emails are received, but in a safe manner where possible. So that being said, the, the autonomous response function is, is key. And to be honest, it, it's really much needed in, in, this, in this day and age. Now, looking at a couple uh, a couple of case studies that, that we've seen and that we picked up. There are two case studies here. I'm going to chat through this first one with a chase fraud alert. This is quite interesting because I'm sure a lot of your clients probably receive many things like this as well. Now, what this is, is basically a completely spoofed attempt to get Lucas, Lucas Gill, to provide some credentials and some information about their banking account and their card. Now, Chase Bank, as probably most of you know, is the second largest banking uh, credit card or credit card issuer in, in the US. Um, what that means is there are probably loads and loads and loads of credit cards that are being issued. But on the back of that, lots and lots of fraud attempts to try and manipulate and um, basically get, get insight into those card numbers, those, uh, those OTPs, all of those types of things. Now, that being said, when, when looking at this specific example, you can see here that this potential spoof was trying to get Lucas to give some information. And what's really clever about this one is that the, the attacker is actually leveraging some really interesting information to try and uh, leverage and, and use Lucas's, um, I suppose, personal emotions to, to get him to click on the link. Now, whenever you get a fraud alert from your bank, the first thing you do is you kind of run into a panic and you don't know what to do. And before you know it, you actually click on something. And that's exactly what, what happens in this instance. So going into, into the detail, we can see what, what Darktrace did here. Instead of the user actually being able to click on this, we've taken a specific action. As that mail was um, inbound into the environment, Darktrace was able to flag a few things. Because of our unsupervised machine learning, because we're not using any predefined rules or signatures, because we're understanding the context and the language and the, the communication style, we've been able to flag that, look, this is one, a suspicious link. This is two, a new contact that you've never con corresponded with. And again, three, unknown correspondence. This is not something that we should be expecting. There's, there's no communication with the specific uh, entity or this domain that we're expecting ever before. Now, what's interesting is uh, the actions that Darktrace takes. Firstly, we lock down the link. We make sure that Kirsty uh, can't take any any actions on this specific link itself. And then, secondly, we're actually holding that message back. So, where possible, we don't even want the user to see this mail. In other cases where it's less severe, well, maybe a different story. What we will do is we'll maybe push it through, lock down the link, uh, convert attachments, do things like that. But in this instance, we know it's a, it's a malicious actor and it's very, very high concern for, for the organization. Therefore, we're going to hold this message back and make sure that the user doesn't actually get it. That's the one example and obviously prone to potentially losing hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, secondly, we have quite an interesting one talking more on the SaaS layer. So I'm, I'm sure probably quite a few of you leverage SharePoint. SharePoint, as you would know, has a lot of sensitive information. This is where a lot of your documents are stored. This is where a lot of your key detail of clients or your, um, your business operations actually sits. And what's interesting about this is the way in which a potential attacker can actually leverage vulnerabilities to be able to infiltrate and exfiltrate data. Now, how this works, and this was a specific example for a large European 
bank of ours. Uh, what happened was that a user's credentials were com compromised. Maybe he left them somewhere, he had a password written down somewhere, or maybe he was actually even potentially an insider threat. At the end of the day, what happened was he ultimately was compromised, an attacker was then able to get into their SharePoint environment and leveraging that channel to get into SharePoint, started doing a scan for any unencrypted passwords. Basically doing a scan across the environment for anything that says passwords or pwd.xls um, or whatever it may be. And in this specific case, it was actually a document that came up with a whole lot of unencrypted passwords. And what's really interesting, as soon as someone accessed that, or as soon as someone did that search for it, Darktrace is able to flag. We are able to deploy across your SaaS environment, protecting not only within that specific um, network visibility, but also providing visibility of communications of, of outside users. So say someone's logging in from a strange location or they're using admin credentials where they shouldn't be. This is really where Darktrace is going to start showing this activity. But for us, it's, it's super interesting in this specific case where an encrypted password was, was found. Darktrace was able to show, okay, look, this person's trying to access this. Is this right? Is this a concern? Why are there unencrypted passwords being, or why is there passwords being stored in an unencrypted file? And even more so, the concern really comes with what's actually going to happen if someone has access to those passwords. So without a technology that's proactively stopping and proactively showing you that this is happening, it's so easy for an organization just to be completely uh, taken down purely through a specific thread that finds its channel into, into your most trusted documents. Now, that being said, this is, this is quite a cool example, but just a very short one. I'm not gonna take up too much time. I know we are running out of time. And for me, that really brings me to the end of, end of the presentation for today. Um, see, there is a chat. Um, oh, sorry, I might be a little bit late. I need to wrap up. But yes, from my side, um, great to chat to everyone. And if there are any questions, please pop them across to me or visit darktrace.com. Thank you very much.